Welcome back to This Is Working. I'm Dan Roth, LinkedIn's Editor-in-Chief. On this show, we talk to leaders who have had a significant impact on society and business, particularly during this pandemic. Uh, I'm really pleased today to have with us Dean Erica James, the head of the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Wharton is the world's first business school, and it's graduated countless notable business leaders. But in its 139-year history, there has never been a female dean or a person of color running the school. That changed in July when Erica James was appointed dean. Being a first in any situation comes with a lot of pressure. Add to that leading one of the most prestigious schools in the country and top that off with a start date in the middle of a global pandemic? As you can guess, the stakes are high. But looking in from the outside, Dean James makes it look easy. James is widely known for her work in crisis leadership and workplace diversity, publishing dozens of papers discussing strategies on how leaders can grow from their mistakes and build trust in their organizations, something we definitely need to be learning more of now. Today, we're going to be asking Dean James about all of these accomplishments and more uh, when, when we will be taking your questions as well. So please be sure to leave them in the comments. Uh, let's keep the chat going. I'll be checking in frequently. With that, I want to bring in Dean James. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Where are you right now? looks like you are you on campus. I am on the very lonely Penn campus right now. Yes, in my office. Well, let's start there. What What is the current state of, of Wharton? Uh, do you, everyone, it's fully remote at this point. What, what, what's, what's life like right now for your students? Uh, so our students are actively engaged. The semester started for our undergraduates several weeks ago and for the MBA students a little bit before that. And so they are operating and, and working and learning from a remote location. Most of our students are in Philadelphia, we have learned. So that means there's an opportunity for them to have community while they're learning, but their learning is just not happening physically on, on Penn's campus at the moment. And that was a change. In the summer, you thought you were going to be able to pull off more of a hybrid model. What, what changed that made you decide to go fully remote? Circumstances sort of outside of our control really affected what the plans that we had been putting in place. So first and foremost, we needed to make sure that the university and the, the city and state had the capacity to deliver uh, testing in a way that would keep the community safe, both the volume of testing and the frequency of testing. And we weren't confident that the supply chain was gonna allow that to happen uh, in a manner that we felt good about. Uh, secondarily, we had to align with the protocols and the uh, guidelines that were being put in place from a number of factors, both what was happening in the city, what was happening across the university, and then thinking through what are the best uh, ways to achieve those goals with the population of Wharton students, both undergraduate and graduate students, both on the Philadelphia campus and on our campus in San Francisco. So. Uh, it was a number of factors, external and internal, that led to the decision to shift from what we had originally thought would be a hybrid experience to a more fully remote experience. And I'll just add one of the main drivers for me was we needed to take control of what we could actually do in delivering a high quality educational experience. And so much of our effort was focused on the external factors that I said, let's just ultimately focus on what we can control and we could control delivering a, a world-class remote experience. Yeah, that's really interesting. Why wait for other factors to come in to tell you how you're gonna be? You just commit to going virtual. So would you walk through what that virtual experience looks like? What is it like for students right now? Is it just a teacher? Is it a professor standing in front of a, a classroom talking? Is it exactly the same as if you were on campus, except now you're you know, Zoom or Teamsing or whatever way to get into it? How is it different? No, of course it's not exactly the same. Uh, our students are very creative. So some of them might be working uh, from their apartment or from a, a location away from the campus. Uh, some of them might be taking a class alone in their bedroom or in their kitchen. Some might have brought a small group of students together to experience a class with a, a small community of people. Um, the faculty, most we have prepared our infrastructure within the university such that if faculty wanted to come into their offices or they wanted to use a, a learning team room or a study room or a classroom to be able to deliver the, um, the education from that setting, we are fully equipped to do that and have all the technology for that. 
Some faculty do in fact come into the building to deliver their, their classes. Other faculty have a setup that they have in their home office or some, some other location and are delivering from there. So it depends by faculty, it depends by class, it depends by students, so we see a little bit of everything. We have made a commitment as much as possible to have a synchronous learning experience. Um, in some cases, we might have asynchronous activity that's happening, but the real value of the Wharton degree is it, the ability to engage in real time with faculty and with other students. And so we've tried to build that in as much as possible. You know, one of the things you mentioned when you made the move to virtual is that what was going to really help Wharton were, and it goes to two things, a global reach and an alumni network. Uh, that was the idea before the semester started. I'm curious if you've tapped either of those now, what that looks like. I think there are probably a lot of people who are on this, uh, watching this interview and wondering how this applies to their school or to their companies, and they're trying to figure it out. So were those two what you believed were going to be two uh, really important um, aspects for making this work, the Global Reach Alumni Network? Have those panned out for, for you so far? They are so far, although we're still, you know, essentially a month into the semester and there's more opportunity we have to tap into that. Uh, we have students, for example, who are in China and we have a physical campus, a physical center in China that um, allows for us to have some activity there for those students who weren't able to, to convene in the United States or in Philadelphia or San Francisco. Um, and, and the beauty about the Wharton School is the alumni network. So we're 100,000 strong and those 100,000 alumni are all over the world. So wherever we have students, we have alumni and we are finding ways to the greatest extent possible to ensure that our alumni are connecting with the students uh, and with each other in those regions of the world as we're delivering um, our education this semester. One tangible example of the power of the Wharton network uh, is our preterm class for our MBA students is called Management 610. And this year we delivered Management 610 very much in a virtual way. Uh, but what we were able to do was galvanize really prominent alumni from all over who came into that classroom in a Zoom format. Uh, and we're talking one-on-one -on -one and having powerful uh, it, conversations with our students and about leadership and about what it meant to manage both in and outside of a crisis situation. And those kinds of engagements are far more difficult to achieve uh, if we were in residence, asking someone to spend a day to travel, to come here, another day to go back to where they come from. So we're able to, to capture our alumni and bring them into the classroom much more uh, with much more facility than we had in the past, which is something that so far our students have very much appreciated. That's really interesting. So are, and are faculty, all faculty taking advantage of that or is that still early? I mean, this idea of not having to fly people in or have prepared case studies, you can just, you can do a live and the students can meet them. I assume that's a big draw. It's, it's a big draw and uh, you know, not all faculty are doing that, but enough of them are that it's creating a sense of variability and, and uh, newness and freshness. Uh, throughout the the profile of one's academic experience this semester, so I think we're very pleased with the progress we're seeing so far. But you know, it's we have three more months of this semester and plenty of opportunity to to learn and pivot and and try new things. Right. Well, it is it is very early, as you said. It's a it's a month in, but I I, I have to ask you: Do you see? Is it possible that whenever we come out of this, how whatever it looks like to come out of this? that this kind of virtual learning, that the sort of remote world we're living in becomes part of the Wharton experience? Or, or, or is it too early to say? It's too early to commit, but I, I definitely think one aspect of what we're experiencing is we're learning new skills. We're creating a, a capability uh, to do things in new and interesting ways. We're innovating in ways we've been forced to innovate in ways that we wouldn't have had to before. And I don't think you want to lose that innovation. You don't want to lose those learnings. I mean, it's the quintessential never waste a good crisis. Uh, and so I also believe that the longer not only schools, but companies are in this environment of working remotely, it starts to become normal in some respects. So we're already building an infrastructure uh, around remote delivery that will likely um, continue to some extent. It will never replace 
ultimately the experience of the, the residential learning environment. And we look forward to having and reuniting our students and our faculty back on campus. But I think that there are things that we've learned here that will become a part of how we deliver education going forward. Mm -hmm. All right, we want to uh, remind everyone you're watching This Is Working. Uh, thank you to all of you who are dropping your questions already in the chat. If you have questions, please be sure to join. Uh, please be sure to enter them there. We have members uh, bringing in questions from all over the country. So let's see a few of these. Denise from Minnesota, Fidelia from Massachusetts, Deborah from California, Cindy from Arkansas, we have Chad from Canada. A uh, good question coming in from Pradeep Srinivasan, who said, um, I've, continue, I've consistently followed the updates and each year admission process at Wharton. Um, and Pradeep says that it looks like there are fewer, there's been a plunge in the number of aspirants who get admits inside this great school. Why is this not only the case in Wharton, but also in the other top 10 business schools? And this person is asking because they are planning to, they would like to study at Wharton in the future and they want to know basically what their chances are of getting in or why is it so hard? What do you think? Is it always going to be this tough? I mean, the supply, I'm sorry, the demand outweighs the supply. That's true at Wharton as it is for many other business schools around the world, frankly. Uh, and so we have to be selective, but it's, it, you know, what we select on matters and that might differ for every school or every every university so uh it is challenging to get into the world's top business schools that's not to say it's it can't be done uh, the fact that we have a robust class this year the fact that applications are up next year the desirability of the product is what's really driving the selectivity and the and the challenge that people experience getting in at the same time you know I encourage people to apply. We're looking for different things every year as circumstances change, as the environment changes, as we seek to broaden uh, the, the pool of people who are here and the number and, and type of alumni that we have. I strongly encourage people who have an interest and believe that their um, areas of focus align with the Wharton School, then I strongly encourage them to apply. All right, so take your shot. That's what it sounds like. There might be some changes coming, uh, but you want to make sure that there is a, uh, a lot of different candidates coming in and the selection process is not what maybe some people think it is, which is just the very top applicants. Yeah. Uh, or, or the applicants who are only focused in finance or the applicant, right? So right. we look at a broad array of factors and so, People should not prejudge what they think the Wharton School is looking for. Great. Uh, some comments coming in from the stream. Deborah says, you seem to have a really good handle on this. Damon says, great work, Wharton, and made a little clapping emoji. And uh, Dwayne Thor said, thank you for your creativity, Dean James. Um, I would love to talk to you about your uh, your area of, of study before you got into to management. So you're a, you are a, a crisis leadership expert. Um, you talk about the difference between a smoldering versus a sudden crisis. 2020 has seemed like a year where of both sudden and smoldering crises. Um, what's your take on how well business is, is handling the, um, the pandemic, uh, uh, of thinking about how they uh, handle racial inequality, especially if this sort of awakening of the role of the, the, that leaders, the business leaders, play after the uh, after the George Floyd killing and the protests around the around the killings of uh, many black Americans mm -hmm. do you think that the that the business is has been handling this year uh, you know if you had to give it a grade what grade would you give kind of corporate uh, the corporate world yeah I, the corporate world is is diverse and so I don't think there's a single grade uh, every company might experience something or you know have is responding to the best that they can so I would say, first of all, that the concept of smoldering versus sudden crises is essentially you know, something that happens to you completely out of the blue that oftentimes you have no control over are the sudden crises. And then the smoldering are the ones that we actually typically uh, experience much more readily. They're the, the small things that are under the radar that we tend to dismiss as if they're not important, but they keep smoldering until they erupt into something significant. This year, to your point, Dan, has been a year where both sm sudden and smoldering crises have been extensive. And I think the, the unique thing about a crisis is that there's generally, they're not things that we have experienced in the past. So there's no playbook for us to pull off of our shelf and say, here's what we do under these circumstances. So in the case of the pandemic, 
it was so severe and so broad ranging and so impactful that every organization, every CEO, every dean, every university president is really making decisions hour by hour, day by day, based on new information that's coming at them. And uh, it's not going to be the same set of answers or responses for every person because the circumstances that we're all dealing with are, are very enough that it requires nuanced approaches. So I think by and large, people are working and operating at to the best of their ability under a set of circumstances that no one has ever experienced before. Um, with respect to what's going on with the, the racial climate in the US, I think we've seen a real awakening there. I think the, the um, unfortunate tragedies surrounding George Floyd and the visibility of that allowed executives and companies and CEOs to come to terms with the challenges of race in this country in ways that they had not needed to or wanted to in the past. And I think people, I think this generation of leaders in particular feels a real responsibility to leverage the power and the resources and, and the influence that business has to try to impact in some large or small way um, how we create a, a community and a society that allows people to be respected and valued uh, across the many dimensions of diversity that exist. And so we're learning. We haven't figured that out yet either. But the fact that there's so much attention and focus on it right now um, and seemingly a level of commitment that hasn't been there before, I think now is the time for all of us to ask the question, what can we do? And just like we are with the pandemic, try anything and use what works and discard and try something else when things don't work. And how much do your do you, are, are you using 2020 as a case study for students? It feels like there has been a real shift in how businesses operate. We've, we have had to change how we operate. So can you teach students, uh, you know, future business leaders or current business leaders who are in these classes, can you teach using the old playbook or do we need to study 2020 and say, this is what business is gonna look like for the next however many years? I think this year is a watershed year for so many reasons and we have to think differently. I don't know the extent, I mean, we're never going back to normal and I think people have now come familiar with the term, the new normal. Uh, there will be a new normal and we're, we don't yet know what that will look like ultimately. But I think the real opportunity here for our students is to, to say, how can I experience this moment in time, learn how to be resilient, learn how to be agile, learn how to be flexible, learn how to adjust to change, but also anticipate change. If I want to be a leader, this is what leadership looks like. And this is the moment in time that I have to demonstrate my capability. And I think we have to bring these lessons into the classroom for our undergraduate students and our graduate students, because at the end of the day, we may not experience a year like this again in our lifetime, but we will experience challenge in new situations that we've not confronted and we will experience some form of crisis. And if we don't capitalize on the lessons learned here, we're really setting ourselves up to um, not be competitive in the work that we do or as a society or country going forward. That's so interesting. So it's less about studying the exact examples from the past, but learning how to, how to manage within a time of constant change. Yeah. Um, I just want to point out, by the way, you talked about these kind of smoldering versus sudden crises. But in 2008, you wrote a case study when you were at Darden about uh, businesses dealing with a pandemic and how to get through a pandemic. It, it seems awfully prescient. to, And a lot of what was in those case studies were exactly how things have played out. Have you gone back to look at that? I, just recently, I actually forgot that I had written that and someone uh, posted it. And I thought, oh, I did write that case study. So I went back and I and I read it. And you know, just like what we're seeing now, you start off with a situation, but then over time, every every day you're presented with new information and something else unfolds and you've got to respond and pivot. And so that case study that I wrote in 2008 does have you know, a part A, a part B, a part C, a part D, uh, because you're constantly needing to address and pivot with respect to new and interesting situations. So I could not have predicted back then that this is the world we would be living in, but uh, that this is also a part of leadership. It's being able to anticipate 
uh, what might be down the pike several years from now and um, take lessons and look at information from a variety of sources to ascertain where your energy and focus needs to be. Yeah, well, I've seen you uh, talks that you've given elsewhere about um, connecting the dots and seeing what's going on in other parts of society and saying, hey, this is going to happen to our business too. So an example that you gave in a speech I had watched was about um, the Me Too movement. And I think you were at uh, the Goizeta School. At that point, you said, look, this is happening in entertainment and media. It is going to happen to us in academia also. We have to be ready for it. How much should, I think that as business leaders, often people get, they think about their own worlds, they focus on, and social media is good about creating these filter bubbles. How often, how do you encourage people to think, or do you encourage um, uh, students to think or to pop those filter bubbles? How, how what, do you expect them to look beyond their industries, beyond their worlds? How, how do you teach that? Yeah, I think part of teaching it is living it by example and then sharing your own stories of, of having done so. So I'll, I'll give you a perfect example of one of the things that I've been considering, especially uh, when the appointment of my announcement was, was made or the announcement of my appointment was made. Uh, Generally, a new leader comes into an organization and they might engage the services of a coach to determine, you know, help them through those first 90 or 100 days. And I was thinking about what kind of coach would I need as the as a newcomer coming into the Wharton School. And I think about the kinds of faculty that we have here who are superstars in their own right. And I think about the kind of work that gets done at the Wharton School. And I think about the vast alumni base that is watching everything that the Wharton School does. And it occurred to me that it might not be sort of the, the traditional management or leadership coach. It might actually be an NFL coach or an NBA coach, someone who is accustomed to dealing with people who have a superstar talents and capabilities and um, status, yet you still need to build a team. You, you need everybody in the organization or on the team working in the same direction. So there are lessons that I can learn as a leader that come from the sports world. And, and there are so many examples of ways that we can leverage information and experiences that happen outside of our own sectors, our own industries that has real value, have real value for the work that we might need to do. And I think we just have to continuously be creative and thinking about sources from which we can draw information to guide our own behavior and actions. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, for everyone tune in, this is this is working. Please continue to leave your comments and questions in the chat. Uh, and let's read a couple of these here. Mike um, Malaf. Kiss. I'm sure I, I bungled that. Sorry, Mike says I'm from Wharton Executive Education, and we have found that simulations are particularly effective in fostering engagement in online learning. Um, and then Frank Gerard said, just left a quote here. He said, "True leadership is defined in times of crises." Uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King put it best when he stated, "The true measure of man is not found in how he behaves in times of comfort and convenience, but in how he stands in times of challenge and controversy." Uh, I guess uh, uh, related to that, I assume that you are are um, that in this time of, of crisis and, and, and controversy, the students probably graduating the next couple of years, this, this is gonna be a, a different kind of, uh, of, of, of graduate, right? They're gonna be, they're forged in very different times than, than in past years. Yeah, they, our students will be defined by this moment in time. Generations are created every, I don't know, 12, 15, 18 years, it seems like. Uh, and there's oftentimes something pivotal that happens in the timing of a generation that influences their behavior and their actions and the thought process and decision-making from that point on. And I think that 2020 is one of those moments. And I, I, I have a son who graduated from high school in 2020, and I think, and starting college now in 2020, and both his senior graduation and the start of his college experience are completely different from certainly what I've experienced and most of us probably watching this, this episode right now. And he will no doubt be defined by what he experienced or didn't experience in this moment in time. And so there's a whole generation of young people for whom their future will be affected, not necessarily in an adverse way, but it will be affected and their trajectory will look very different from what it might have um, had the pandemic, had the the protest, had twenty twenty turned out turned out <laughs> differently. All right, I want to continue on this trajectory question. Um, you said something really. You you've been a uh, 
uh, uh, advocate for diversity in business for a long time and have made uh, very strong moves on that in every school you've you've led or worked at. Um, you gave a quote to NPR recently where you said, I think that if we can create social media platforms, if we can put people on the moon, if we can have self-driving cars, there's very little we can't do. So the fact that we have not yet created a more diverse work environment means that we simply haven't prioritized it. Uh, I'd love for you to talk about that, especially in light of, I don't know if you saw well, Wells Fargo's CEO who was in the news um, this last week for saying that there was the part of the reason they're not hitting their diversity targets is there's just not enough uh, quality candidates out there for them to be hiring. Um, how do you, this is what you're saying is this is a problem that we can solve. We have the best minds in the world here. We can solve this problem. And then you have business leaders who are saying, no, nah, it's not really. This is like a really, really hard one for us. Uh, wh wh how do you bring those two together? <laughs> so the one thing that I would agree with the Wells Fargo CEO is, is that um, it is a hard problem, but it's not an impossible problem. And I, I don't agree that um, the challenge that he's communicated and articulated is necessarily the problem. Um, I, I have supported and, and talked about and advocated a focus on diversity broadly defined for, for quite some time. And I, I think now is the moment that we come together and try to really solve the issues that are at hand. Uh, for me, we tend to focus on the, the terminology we use is diversity, equity, and inclusion or some variant of that. But we tend to focus on just the diversity piece, which is the number and the representation. How many people do you have from different backgrounds and demographic profiles? And that matters and it will continue to matter. But I think where we also focus less attention on, but is perhaps equally, if not more important in some cases and for some organizations, are on the equity and the inclusion aspects of EEI. So how do we create an environment that is equitable, that allows everyone to feel and be valued and respected and to contribute at the highest level, and that shares the outcomes appropriately across the diversity that does exist? We're not really talking about that aspect as much as we are, how do we just hire more people? And I think we should be. We're also not talking about the inclusive aspect which is how do we, again, create this, this community that feels, uh, that allows people to share and be their full selves, which is actually what you want. That's the value of diversity is bringing people's unique perspectives and ideas and experiences to help solve interesting problems and challenges within the organization. And once we're able to do that, that's what allows an organization to be competitive. That's what allows an organization to be innovative. And if we're not paying attention to what we're doing with the diversity that we already have in our organizations, it becomes that much more difficult to attract the talent that does exist into those organizations. So it all matters. And I think we are just not prioritizing all three diversity, equity, and inclusive aspects of the work that, that we're confronting. Huh. So you think that, that leaders are too focused on one part of it, but they're not thinking about how they all play, uh, play together. Um, right. I don't know if you saw City. City just had a report yesterday that said that uh, we could gain about five trillion dollars in um, a five trillion dollar boost to GDP if we could lessen racial uh, disparity. So there are real numbers behind this as well. Um, do you, how do you think about? You are a first in this role. You are the the first uh, black female leader of, of of Wharton, the oldest business school in the world. Um, you've been the first many times. Uh, what do you tell people who are coming into, who, who might be at a bank and saying, you know, this is, I, I don't see anyone like me around here, or I'm the first in this, in this position. How, how do you tell people, how have you managed being a first before? And what kind of counsel do you give other people who are also firsts? Yeah. So thank you for that question. Let me just first uh, clarify that the Wharton School is the first collegiate school of business in the US. Uh, there were some schools in Europe just a handful of years before, before Wharton was created. But in the US, we are the first undergraduate business education. Uh, and, and we're very proud of, of that. Um, to answer your question, being a first is it's a, it's a tricky situation. On the one hand, you feel considerable um, responsibility. You feel, con I feel considerable um, 
it's an honor to to be in this have this opportunity and to be in this position to to lead one of the world's greatest business schools. Um, and yet, I also recognize that when people are a first, the eyes of everyone are on them, and people are there's a curiosity that exists. There are certain expectations that people have about how you will act, how you respond, what you will do. Some of those ex expectations make it easier for you to do your work. Some of those expectations make it more difficult. Um, so there's a, 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 a level of pressure, if you will, that exists. But by and large, my own personal experiences, both at the Wharton School and when I was dean at, the, at, at Emory's uh, Goizueta Business School, is that by and large, people want you to be successful. They want you to have a good experience in their organization and they're there to support you. And I think as long as you've built the team and surround yourself by people who are aligned in the vision that you have for the organization, there's a, a way to take advantage of being the first and recognizing that the attention that you're receiving can help foster the goals that you have for the organization. And that's how I try to leverage this particular moment in time is utilize our alumni and our faculty and our students who want Wharton to be successful and want my leadership uh, for Wharton to be successful at this particular time. Well, we got a comment that came in on the stream from Sonia Adamson, who's a Wharton student. She said, part of leadership is to anticipate what's going to happen in the future. Well said. So proud to have you as the dean. It's clear that you've got some real backers among the faculty and students. Um, and uh, Dean James, thank you for joining us here today. This has been terrific uh, conversation. I think you have taught us all a lot, and we'll all be watching to see how you're guiding uh, Wharton in the future. You came in at a very tough time, and uh, it gives you a real opportunity to uh, change and, and, and shape the school. Uh, so we hope we'll have you back here at some point to talk about what else you're learning and what the future of education looks like now that you've got a few more semesters with this pandemic under our belt, or maybe it's gone by then, we'll see. Um, but Dean James, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dan. Pleasure being here. All right, uh, stick around later uh, the, uh, on for, from LinkedIn News, and we are going to have a great show talking about 2020's LinkedIn top startups list. This is a ranking of 50 young companies that have found ways to pivot and navigate amid COVID-19. We're going to come live at 12 p.m. with the CEO of the number one company on the list, that is the real estate firm Better to discuss strategies for leading amid a crisis. You won't want to miss this. Really interesting. Thank you all for joining me here. Thank you for your questions. We will see you next week on LinkedIn News, and this is working.